Hello everyone, I am now live. It's uh, somewhere around one minute before nine o'clock, so I thought I would come on just a minute early. Sometimes I've been a minute or two late. So uh, just wanna kind of adjust things here too. Hello Lillian, looks like you're the first. Welcome. And uh, uh, we're good morning to you. And I'm uh, very glad that you're here. There are now three on board, according to the four now. Rosemary, welcome. And uh, it, uh, I think we'll, we should be getting ready for the little ding dong uh, to come about in a, in a minute or so to uh, let us know that it is actually nine o'clock. Um, I'm still kind of getting settled here. We have six on board already. Chris, welcome. Uh, and uh, uh, today is Saturday morning, um, May 16th. We are now just over the halfway point of May of this month. It seems like it just began, didn't it? St. Joseph the Worker was, well, it was two weeks ago now, two weeks and two days ago. And so we're at the midpoint of May. Uh, May having 31 days does not divide evenly by two. Uh, so there it is, um, nine o'clock. So officially, good morning, officially welcome everybody. Um, there are seven people viewing right now, so I hope we have a few more. And uh, uh, what I thought I would do in this chat, for one thing, is have a, uh, share my new cup with you, which uh, uh, Mary Pat, if you're watching, here is a cup. This was this is what your present to me was, Mary Pat. Thank you so very much. It's, uh, as I think you should be able to see more or less, it is The Last Supper uh, by Leonardo da Vinci printed on the cup. And uh, I've always um, wondered why uh, Leonardo would paint this wonderful depiction of the Last Supper with everybody sitting on one side of the table, not socially distancing at all. Uh, you know, somebody uh, told the story of the apostle going to the upper room, the disciples going to the upper room to make the arrangements, and they say, we need a table for 25. And the host, the owner of the room says, but there's only 12 of you, well, 13 of you. And he says, well, we're all going to sit on one side. Uh, I guess that's uh, uh, for the, for the um, photographer to be on the other side. Anyway, uh, again, if you are watching, Mary, Pat, uh, thank you so very much. It is a very nice mug. I like the size of it. I like the shape. And, of course, I like the coffee. There is Mary Pat. Good. Thank you. Uh, so, today, the 16th of May, uh, if we look in the missal, missalettes, uh, prayer books, and whatever, uh, including the ordo, by the way, when I say ordo, anybody who is a sacristan knows what I mean, but those who are not probably don't. This is a book that ever since I can remember, it's been in the sacristy uh, of every single church. Uh, it's now in English. I can remember way, way back when it was in Latin. Um, but what it has is uh, for every day of the year, it has the uh, basically the the directions as to where to find the mass texts for that day and the uh, liturgical 
the liturgy of the hours. So um, actually this edition on the other side, it has the necrology of priests. So for example, today, which is the 16th, Saturday the 16th, it has nothing. Uh, just Saturday the 16th. So it's a seasonal weekday, Saturday of the fifth week of, of Easter. Tomorrow will be the sixth Sunday of Easter. And let me see who is who is uh, commemorated on the left side as the priests who died on this day. There's Deacon Joseph Mannion from L.A. Uh, Reverend James Hofto, O.M.I. I did not know him. Reverend Joseph Robert Meckler, I knew him. He died in 2006. Patrick Gorman, we used to call him P.J. Gorman, died in 2006, so they died on the same day. Uh, a Sigmund Snyder Franciscan died in 1996. And then we go back to a Richard Lehman, uh, died in eight, 1988, he's from San Bernardino. Deacon Louis Guerre died in 1986. I remember in the late 70s, uh, Louis Guerre was one of the first class of deacons uh, uh, what, who were ordained when they began to implement the restored order of the diaconate here in Los Angeles. Uh, and uh, I was teaching in that class. Um, uh, uh, teaching uh, liturgy to the deacons. Uh, so I do have to say that liturgically that first crop of deacons were um, were uh, uh, well were well prepared. Uh, Irene just says rest in peace PJ that's from St. Bernadette Parish. So PJ Gorman was at St. Bernadette's Parish way back when is that is that correct? Um, I don't know. Then the two others, uh, one died in 1945 and the other in 1916. Reverend Philip Farrelly uh, from the Diocese of Fresno died in, uh, in 1916. Joel, Father Joel, welcome to you. Uh, the, the point that I was going to make in bringing up this ordo is that there's no saint's feast listed today. However, if we look in the, uh, uh, the lives of the saints, Butler's Lives of the Saints, which I do almost every day, there are found one, two, three, four, five, six, seven saints' biographies, brief biographies in here for today, and then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven more that are listed here who's, who are not, the book doesn't say anything about his life. So one of the things that we need to realize is uh, the church recognizes an awful lot more saints than we celebrate in the, in the general calendar. There are some saints that are celebrated in particular countries' calendars. Uh, we'll see two of them today, but um, particular countries or particular religious orders, but uh, and also um, particular dioceses will have certain saints. For many years, and I think he still is, uh, Saint Emedius was uh, uh, celebrated in Los Angeles and in San Francisco. The reason being that Amelius was a patron of earthquakes, of protection from earthquakes. So, um, one other little footnote here about canonization. When you can canonize a saint, when the church canonizes a saint, it is an official recognition that that person lived and died in a way that is worthy of eternal life. 
Uh, I think it's going a little bit too far to say that is an infallible declaration that that person is in heaven, uh, but it, that certainly is the assumption to be made because what, what the church is doing is saying this person has a life that is worthy of imitation, that they lived a life that uh, shows that their companionship with us as in the communion of saints is one that we can venerate, we can uh, ask that person to intercede for us, to pray for us, basically. Uh, all of our veneration of the saints is that we acknowledge that they were people who were holy and uh, that we can pray, basically asking them to pray for us, that they are in a position before God to um, to intercede for us, to be our companions in prayer before God. That's one reason why uh, in canonizing saints, uh, being able to identify miracles is very important. The miracle being something, usually a healing, that is beyond the capabilities of science, medicine, to understand that uh, at the when one prays to this person and uh, say a group of people praying for somebody uh, who is who is sick and that person seemingly miraculously recovers, uh, we would say, well, if it's identifiable that there's a connection between the prayer to for this particular. Uh, uh, saint, potential saint, to uh, the prayer to that person to pray with us to God the Father to intercede for the gift of healing, that that prayer is efficacious. That, In other words, the person is in a position in heaven to, uh, uh, to effectively intercede on our behalf here. So the reason for a miracle is uh, just a sign that, that that person is in a position to really pray for us and that their prayer is heard because of their relationship with God. So a miracle is kind of a, uh, an, an, an important thing as far as uh, canonization is concerned. It's a recognition that, uh, yes, this person is a friend of God, not phony, not make-believe, uh, whatever, but the real thing the real thing. Uh, basically, canonization simply means it's an affirmation that this person who has died is the real thing before God, what we all want to be. We are all called to be saints. And that's why I think it's important for us to have an understanding that uh, all of these saints whose lives are recorded, uh, sometimes very legendary, as we'll see in a minute, but uh, whose lives are recorded in these books, who are venerated as on the Roman calendar, really their meaning for us is that the body of Christ extends not only in space throughout the world, but also extends throughout all time, so that we are connected with the communities in the Philippines, in Italy, in Rome, uh, in uh, Africa, in Asia, in other parts of the United States, in North America, South America, Catholic Christian communities throughout the world, we are united with them, not just in a sort of uh, um, uh, superficial a uh, good feeling sort of way, but that we are genuinely united with them because we are members of the same body of Christ. We are therefore in Christ children of one Father because we are united with the one eternal Son of God. And you know, that theology, reflecting on that, can take us in a lot of directions which I have already talked about before, I won't anymore. But the, the idea of the saints 
uh, is that that union as the one body of Christ extends in the direction of time also. That uh, we are united as members of the body of Christ with those who have gone before us into the promised fulfillment of union with Christ. Uh, we can't picture that. Uh, artists try to picture that. Most of what we get in the, our minds are uh, the inventions of, of artists who take this promise as articulated in, in Scripture and sort of look at it, uh, sort of try to depict in some sort of human symbol what eternal life might be. And that, that's fine. But we always have to recognize that what God has promised is beyond our the possibility of our understanding. It's beyond the possibility, you know, as St. Paul says, what I, have, what I cannot see and ear cannot hear. It's beyond uh, what God has promised to us. It, it's, it's beyond uh, our, our human abilities at this point to grasp, to understand. Um, so, basically, a declaration of a saint does not necessarily mean, it's not simply that they are in heaven. It is that we can be assured that they are faithful uh, models for us, their lives are faithful models for us, and that they are faithful intercessors, they are faithful companions with us before God. They can pray for us. Now, uh, most of the saints that are recognized in the church were never formally canonized. The process of canonization uh, developed throughout probably more or less the Middle Ages and later Middle Ages it began to become codified. Often a saint was simply somebody who the People around him said, hey, this person is holy. We venerate this person. We, we want to continue to be united with this person in prayer, in faith. We uh, see this person as, an, as a model, as an intercessor, and sort of canonization by acclamation, they would some, some would say. Uh, as we get more and more close to the modern era, that becomes codified in canon law, in the ways that, that, that the church kind of wants to regulate things. Because sometimes what happens is uh, certain groups might form and uh, propose to venerate uh, somebody who really, you know, you look at their life and they weren't worthy of it. And, you know, so it's, it's kind of a way of putting some kind of an official seal of approval on that person's uh, life as a, uh, as a holy person. So, that having been said, here are two saints that I don't think were ever formally canonized, but they have been forever recognized as saints. Today, if you are Irish, you, are probably, you probably know and have celebrated St. Brendan. St. Brendan's feast is today. I believe that it is a feast and an important feast in Ireland, in the Church of Ireland. I didn't actually look that up, but I think that he is celebrated there. He probably is not celebrated uh, most anywhere else, at least not officially as a part of the regular calendar. But Brendan was an abbot a monk who lived from 486 to 575. So he was what? Less than 500 years after the time of Jesus. I always like to kind of locate them on this timeline. We've got 2,000 years. He was just at the end of the first quarter. End of the first quarter of the span of Christianity from the time of Christ to today. So he was quite a while ago but uh, the church had developed uh, quite a bit by that time. The Irish monks uh, had their own brand, shall we say, of Christianity. They were, 
pretty far removed from Rome. Uh, they were authentically Catholic. There were some elements of popular native folk religion that, were, that came into their worship, and there were some elements, central elements of popular folk religion uh, that were um, totally rejected by them in favor of Christianity. So the Irish, in embracing Christianity, did so with their own, with their own uh, flavor, but nonetheless were very much aligned to the heart of the, uh, Roman, the, the, the Roman church. Now, uh, Jan said, the navigator, exclamation point. Yes, Brendan the navigator. Actually, many of the monks of that time traveled a great deal. Uh, they traveled not to go on vacation. They did travel to discover uh, one element of it was. They did travel to discover the world. Not the world in a tourist sense, but the world that needed Jesus Christ to be brought to them. So their travels were based on faith. Um, they would often go on pilgrimage to holy sites, like the Holy Land, but they uh, often were being on this little island. At, Europeans would say, this island is at the edge of the world. You better be careful how far you go because you might fall off. Uh, the Irish navigators said, well, nobody has fallen off yet. And they kept going. And so he is venerated as the navigator uh, in part because of a story that was written 300 years or so after his time uh, called The Navigation of St. Brendan. And uh, it depicts him discovering uh, lots of fanciful stuff in the sea as he is traveling westward, he and his, his fellow monks. Uh, and basically they were, they were looking kind of for a place of promise, uh, somewhere that, that was better than what they had. Uh, does that sound familiar? Um, they, author of this says, this quest for a happy world retains some features from early apocryphal writings and others from Irish folklore, but it's still attractively readable today. It tells of various adventures on the way. And here's the quote from it, which is kind of fun. On this journey, four seasons have been determined for you. That is, the day of the Lord's Supper is celebrated with the holy man, Easter on the island, which is really the back of a sea monster, and from Easter to Pentecost with us on Paradise Island, and Christmas on the island of Aelby up to Mary's Feast on Candlemas. At the end of the seventh year, you will reach the land you are seeking, and you will be there 40 days, and then be born back to your homeland. Wherever the monks go, the birds join in singing the psalms. They meet whales, icebergs, and volcanoes. And it goes on further. Some of the details may be based in, in reality, as Irish monks did, in fact, travel to the Faroes and to Iceland. But the dialogue and much else seem to be based on charming imagination of the narrator. The big question, of course, that we have was, did uh, Brendan actually succeed in going beyond Iceland and uh, land on what we would now call America. And that is an, a question that uh, can only be speculated about and cannot be answered. So we will let that one be. You decide for yourself. And when you get to heaven, we'll all ask him together. There is another saint celebrated today that um, probably all the Carmelites among us will uh, recognize and are devoted to, and that is St. Simon Stock, who, just from the name, 
Simon Stock. Uh, sounds English, doesn't it? Well, he was English. He lived uh, in the neighborhood of 1265. Uh, that's probably the year he died. Doesn't say when he was born. But uh, he, he was an English monk who went to the Holy Land and joined other monks in living on the side of Mount Carmel. And he would have been one of the... Uh, one of the monks gathered together that uh, formed and established the uh, Carmelite order, which in coming back from the Holy Land to England, to other parts of Europe, really took off uh, and um, uh, became a, a mendicant order, which means that they were not monks, but they were friars. What's the difference between a monk and a friar? And I don't mean a friar who uh, cooks things or, or is cooked, but uh, a friar, F-R-I-A-R, it comes from the Latin word frater, which means brother. Uh, the idea was that the certain orders, the Carmelites, the Franciscans who came along just around the same time, the Dominicans were mendicants. They did not live in a monastery nearly as much as they went forth to live among the people and to go from place to place, town from, to, from city to city, uh, proclaiming the good news, evangelizing. Uh, they were important for reforming the church at that time. And there are a lot of, a lot of stories about you know, how they came to be, how they came about. But the important thing was that they were all reforming uh, communities that went out to be among the people. And uh, they had famous preachers. St. Anthony Padua was one of the uh, uh, foremost Franciscan uh, uh, preachers, but they also, and the Carmelites were, were famous for this too, they also were caring for the poor and the sick. So what the, the kind of lifestyle that they lived was not rooted in any earthly values. It wasn't rooted in a monastery, a location. It was not rooted in family identity. It was not rooted in anything uh, identifiable with uh, worldly values and worldly ideals. It was always rooted in uh, Jesus Christ alone. And Jesus, the Jesus Christ who did not have a place to lay his head but who was, came to be present to people where they are, where they are, rather than um, uh, establish a place that people would then have to come to you if they wanted whatever you had to give. No, they were bringing Christ as the greatest gift that they could possibly imagine into the world of uh, the people, especially the poor, the needy, uh, and the perhaps not so physically needy, but very, very spiritually needy. Uh, in fact, one of the things that all of these mendicant orders did, Carmelites, Dominicans, Franciscans, they attracted people of means. They attracted people of wealth who were willing to give up all of that. And the order itself didn't say, well, you give it to us and take a vow of poverty. They said, you give it away. You do the work of Christ by giving what you have away and then come and follow uh, in the footsteps of St. Francis, uh, St. Uh, Dominic, uh, St. Simon Stock, whoever. Now, we always uh, associate St. Simon Stock with the uh, brown scapular, don't we? The the giving of the brown scapular, I'm sorry to say, friends, but the giving of the brown scapular to St. Simon Stock is something that was recorded only two centuries after uh, he lived. 
In other words, that, that um, visitation, that apparition of Mary giving him the scapular and promising that whoever dies wearing the scapular will be saved, or just exactly what the text of that promise is, I don't know. Uh, but it's definitely a promise of salvation if you die wearing the scapular. Uh, the, the primary thing to, to remember is that the scapular is the Carmelite habit. It is the essential key part of the Carmelite habit, as a scapular was part of the, the uh, habits of other religious uh, orders and religious communities too. And that was, uh, there would be a robe, and then there would be a strip of cloth with a hole in the middle for your head that would go from back uh, almost to the ground and forward almost to the ground. That's what the scapular was. A strip, uh, a strip of cloth uh, about shoulder width that would go uh, from, go down on both sides almost to the ground. Uh, the scap, the brown scapular that is in popular uh, use and devotion today basically is an abbreviated version of that two pieces of cloth connected by what looked like shoestrings, uh, uh, wear it in front and in back. And um, I, I personally do not believe that it should be worn as a kind of an amulet, that if I die while wearing this, no matter what, no, you know, no matter how bad I am, I'll, I'll get to heaven eventually. Uh, I, I, I think that's, you know, the sin that we learned way, way back when, the sin of presumption. Uh, the, the object itself has no power apart from the intention with which you make use of it. And so your intention has to be to live according to the spirit of the Carmelite order, even if you are a layperson. Uh, to live in accord with the spirit, the values, the lifestyle, the commitment to Jesus Christ that is an active part of your life, uh, then the scapular can be a, a sign of that. So the scapular has value only insofar it, as it is a sign of what your own intentions in your own way of living your life in union with Christ, under the patronage of Mary, his mother and our mother, as we have spoken many times, how and why she is truly our mother. Uh, so uh, that is the value of, of a scapular. So Carmelites today will honor St. Simon Stock, the Irish among us, will honor uh, St. Brendan. We all should honor both of them, along with uh, St. Alexander of Caesarea, who was an early martyr, St. Posidius, who was an early bishop, uh, St. Carantac, who was a bishop also in Ireland and Wales and Cornwall and Brittany, 44 martyrs of Palestine, um, and uh, St. Andrew Bobola, who was a martyr in the, sixth, in, the fifth, in the 17th century. He was from a Polish family. And then St. Peregrine, who was Bishop of Auxerre, uh, St. Felix and Gennadius, St. Abdas and his companions in Persia, Fidolis, a priest in Gaul, Honoratus, a bishop in Gaul, St. Germarius, Bishop of Toulouse, Toulouse, in the late seventh century. Toulouse is where the airbuses are made. And St. Ubald, St. Ubald, who was abbot of Fermo. So all of them are, uh, are actually in some way or other, probably somewhere or other, celebrated today. So we've got a huge cloud of witnesses that are uh, 
that are very much part of our family because we are all united together in our identity as the body of Christ. Uh, to me, that is a wonderful reason why heaven has to be eternal. Why, if there is a God at all, and if this God is a God who loves us, who is love, who has revealed himself to us in love and draws us to himself, we've got a lot of wonderful stuff waiting for us. Uh, and we need to be careful. We need to be careful to begin that life of union with God and with his whole people, which means billions and billions and billions of them, by the way that we relate to one another in Christ now. So may this day for you, for me, for all of us, be a fruitful step on this pilgrimage of life. The pilgrimage of life does not end, but ultimately will step into a new and absolutely fantastic beginning in the fulfillment of love. So let's today simply pray for one another. And as we often do, uh, let's conclude with the Lord's Prayer and Hail Mary and the doxology. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us, sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. God bless you all. May the blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit come upon all of you and remain forever. Amen. Thank you for your good words, Irene. Thank you all for uh, sticking with me, sticking with us. And uh, I pray that we will all go forth into a wonderful, wonderful day, uh, another step on this pilgrimage of life, pilgrimage to eternal life. Amen. God bless you all. Bye-bye.